Grant Stern, and this is PINAC News. We're here with another episode of PINAC Live, interviewing Jacob Crawford. He is the head of Oakland's WeCopWatch.org and a national activist involved in the recording of police. Jason, thank you so much for joining us from Oakland today. Jacob, you hear me over there? Yeah. <laughs> You're back on there, buddy. All right. You hear us okay How's there? It? Yeah, I, I, I can hear you good. Oh, Just ready, sure. Jacob. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, these things happen. It's live, so. Uh, anyway, welcome to, to Pinnacle Live. Thanks for joining us from Oakland today. Yeah, thank you for having me. So uh, tell our audience a little bit about the group that you run, and it's based at the website www.wecopwatch.org. Okay. Yeah, so We Cop Watch um, is something that I co-founded and I do not run, but, uh, but we started it in 2013, and we started it because, you know, and Carlos, you know, can, can testify the, the last 10 years there's been a, a major shift in public consciousness around police misconduct and around the need to actually be documenting them. So, so oh, yeah. yeah, it went from something that was kind of taboo to something that's all of a sudden daily headlines. Yeah. I mean, I, I used to actually feel really, really scared cop watching and very isolated, even, you know, being part of groups and whatnot. But um, yeah, so, so we started We Cop Watch out in Oakland to kind of help foster other groups and train other people about their rights when they're stopped by the police and then also while watching the police. And so, you know, initially it was just to do that, you know. Um, if people wanted to start a group, we'd, we'd send them resources, get on the phone, you know, maybe we could do a Skype training if it was uh, people that were far away. But a lot of it was real boots on the ground, Oakland, where where the consciousness is already very, very real and very alive. And so it's just was a matter of nurturing it. Um, and, you know, I guess just the way the sign of the times are, uh, the, the need and the idea has grown, you know, significantly. And especially over the last year, as we'll probably be talking about. But, but yeah, initially just the idea of We Cop Watch was not to be so much a group that's cop watching, although we do cop watch all the time, but more to try to support other groups that want to go out and watch the police. Okay, so We Cop Watch is something of an umbrella group um, for those who want to get involved with citizen journalism, essentially. Yes, exactly. I mean, that's the one real amazing thing about Cop Watch is it's like this two-part thing, right? Walking up to the police and making your presence known could be a deterrent to police misconduct, and that's something that we find really, really valuable about about what we do is that if nothing else, in the moment, police are more likely not to hurt people when there's a caring community there, willing to document, willing to stand there, and willing to advocate for the victim. But then the other part of it is actually being a journalist, is, is taking notes, you know, is documenting what happened as it happened, and making sure that if something does happen, then you can bring it to the people. And I think Baltimore is a, a really good example, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but you know, you've know, you got uh, Kevin Moore going out and cop watching for his community, for his neighbor, for his friend, Freddie Gray. And then when there was a lot of question in the, the week following, um, you know, that documentation went to the people, and it, uh, I think a lot of things have happened as a result. I, I think we can all agree that a lot has happened because of Kevin's courageous video and I mean that's why people go out there and cop watch because it also it creates evidence so how did you get into cop watching what what drew you into being a cop watcher well I'm I won't deny it I like many people have had very bad experiences with law enforcement and uh, I moved out to Oakland California in 2000 and what I got to see very immediately was that there were a lot of people they were having it a lot harder than I was, you know, okay. like, like people were having hard times just walking to the store. Wow. And, you know, this is before I say this again, like time and time again, but this is like way pre YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and anything well, yeah, like in that. In 2000, it was, uh, you might've had digital video. 
But yeah, it was just, still yeah. on a tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was still on a tape. It, it took you know, it took a while to get online, and I mean, um, onto your computer, and to, I don't even know where you could put it online back in the day. So. Oh man, I yeah. was using it back in two thousand, and I can tell you, you could basically put it on the tape. Yep, <laughs> that's where it stayed. Yeah, it was digital, so, but unless you had maybe a Macintosh, um, even still, like there was nowhere to put it. Like you said, you could just put it onto the internet. Um, if you had your own server and then somebody could download it. Yeah, exactly. Um, maybe you put it into a VHS tape. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And so, yeah, so back then I did have a camera. Um, I was, I was, you know, I had a video camera. It was digital. And so I thought, wow, I should, uh, you know, this is like Land of the Panthers. This is where people would actually go out and, and document the police and, and advocate for people. And during that time period, there was a Oakland police gang called the Riders. And they were out, you know, just jacking people, handcuffing, and, 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 and then taking people, you know, where people couldn't see and torturing them and planting weapons and all of that. So I was like, man, maybe I, you know, I should just be videotaping the cops. And this wasn't a unique idea. Like, there was a group called Berkeley Cop Watch, and they've been around already 10 years. And, of course, the Black Panthers, like, that was the birth of the Black Panthers was in Oakland, California. Right. So, so I immediately, I got in touch with a lawyer, and I got in touch with Berkeley Cop Watch. I, I, I learned about my rights, and, and, I, and I went out there. And for the first couple of months, I did it very covertly. Like, I, I had a, uh, I'd drive around with a car, and I'd have a camera on the roof that I could move, the little thing, and there'd be a TV down by my, uh, by my feet in the passenger side. And I was just wow. doing it like that, you know? And, and, but okay, so then I get pulled over, and, and this cop says he knows who I am. Oh wait, no, I got pulled over by one cop who knew I, who I was. And then a week later, from the same agency, this other cop comes out to me and says, "I know who you are. I know what you do. And you're going to get shot." And wow, I was like, "Whoa, that's okay." Really scary. Yeah, and then oh, it was even scarier that my car was parked three blocks away, and I get back to my car, and he's waiting for me. You know, and oh. again, this is such a long time ago, so there was no place to to put this online, but I did have it recorded. I did put it on the radio and, um, and I joined up with Berkeley cop watch. Cause you know, really, if you, if, if you're going to watch the police and you're going to do it, you're going to run into a lot of obstacles and it's really good to be part of a community, whether it's a global community or boots on the ground cop watch group so that you've got that support. And that's the one thing about cop watch is really, really awesome is that cop watch exists in neighborhoods and communities where it's needed. And, and it exists only through the support of, of your community. So if people don't want you around, you don't you just don't exist, you know? So Yeah. Well that's that's very important to note that it's all about the strength in numbers that are generated. Like I mean, in an individual incident, you may be the only person. But then once something happens, it's good to be part of a community because you know, a community can go out there and face the police as an organization of their own. Yeah, no, indeed. It's very difficult to face a group of police that are actively opposing. It's very easy to get set up by them. You know, they can like raid your house and drop a gun. Like, if you don't, if you're not part of something, it's so much easier to disappear in the darkness of the night in a, you know, in a whisper and like never be heard. So, so yeah, I joined with Berkeley. Um, I, I learned a lot because I learned from Andrea Pritchett, who was the founder of Berkeley Cop Watch. So, I, I just, you know, I got it in like 1990, right? Yeah, yeah, before Rodney King. So, and you know, and so, so I, I took that knowledge and I figured, wow, this is like great. Like everybody should know what cop watches and everybody should know their rights. And um, and so I collaborated with a couple cop watches and I made a documentary slash training video called "These Streets Are Watching," and it it goes over your rights when you're stopped by the police and it goes over how to be an effective cop watcher and it takes place in. Berkeley and in Oakland. It takes place in Denver where there was a really awesome cop watch. And then Cincinnati where it was the first riot of the new millennium, you know what I mean? And, and there were people just taking a stand against police brutality out there. So, Yeah, so uh, what's, what's the name of that video again and how long is it? Is it something that our audience could find on YouTube? Oh yeah, you should. Uh, it's called These Streets Are Watching. It's the first in the streets, non-dramatized, know your rights video that deals with your rights when stopped by the police and while cop watching. Um, it, <laughs> we released it finally in 2004, but I, I think it's just as relevant today. I should be making a sequel, but if you look at it, you'll see that you know, the issues with police are timeless. And um, and the resistance as well. So, well, I mean, we'll link to that when we finalize the the video. So, if you're watching it later, there should be a link right here. 
so, so you can see that video. Yeah. So l let's talk about some of your activities, some of your organizing activities outside of Oakland, because you guys are, are active in Oakland, but you guys are also helping get cameras into the hands of those who need them in other places. So tell us a little bit about those activities. Yeah, so that we didn't even know that this was going to be something that, that we would do. And, um, and it was kind of remarkable, fascinating, and beautiful. And, uh, you know, it, I, look, so I work for the president of the National Lawyers Guild. Her name is Rachel Letterman, and um, she's been suing the Oakland police for the last 10 years. And uh, because of my... Yeah, hobby. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, but um, so, so I, you know, as a cop watcher, I was trying to get some, you know some information from Carlos and other people to try to figure out how to be a journalist because essentially I was doing the same thing, right? I was fact finding, gathering documentation. I was literally, my findings at a certain time period were getting cops fired, were getting cops disciplined. And um, yeah, so I was like, wow, I'm going to be a journalist, you know, like Carlos, I've been saying for Carlos for years, get me involved, man. I want to be doing this. And, um, but finally, uh, Rachel, she picked me up and she gave me a hard drive that was just full of Oakland police body cameras and handheld videos and well, I knew all the cops. So I was able to show <laughs> what cop did what, where, how, and, wow. uh, $7 million later in settlements, I, I think I got a job. And so I work as an investigator and I work with a person that is, you know, really, really cares about the same issues. So when Ferguson happened, you know, I was like, I, I don't know what to do because I'm looking at cops pointing sniper rifles at kids in broad daylight. And while I've been watching this stuff for 15 years, like I, I feel compelled. And even though it's not my neighborhood, not my, my place, I, I, I felt like I should put my body on the line and at least get in between the cops and people and videotape them like the way we do with cop watch, right? Sure. And, and so she was like, yeah, do it, please. And, and I was hesitant because, again, like, I don't believe in going into other people's communities and, and doing stuff like that. But, but I don't know. I just, my heart told me to. Before this happened. Well, I, yeah, but, but I was asked. It's the nature of an awakening, isn't it? That, yeah. You know, you, you just, you feel like everything is comfortable. But after something really important happens, you realize that somebody needs to take action. That's something. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so. But in all the times that I have done it, it's always been because I communicated with people on the ground and, you know, and, and there was a need, a desire, and an invitation. But with Ferguson, there was no invitation. And I just said I had to do it. I didn't know anybody out there, and I just did it. And, and so I flew out, and it was right around the time that they pulled the cops back for a couple days. It was after the first few days, and, um, and the pacification thing had, had begun. You know, people in the streets, you know, there's going to be justice, blah, blah, blah. Anyways... Yeah, so two, day, two days into it, I'm like, I'm going to probably go home because, you know, it, it looks like this is just going to be how it, how, it, how it is, you know, like maybe we'll have justice, maybe we won't, either which way, you know, there's enough people here that the cops don't probably want to hurt people in front of everybody. Spoke too soon. Um, and way so, too soon, way too yeah, soon. And so stuff's going down. But anyways, kind of in that process, I was trying to figure out how did it get from you know, this police shooting to people in the streets just, you know, in an all-out rebellion. And, and you know, there's a lot of people there from St. Louis County that everybody's pissed at the cops, so I got that. But I really wanted to know from people on the ground in Ferguson because there was no recent police shootings. Like in Oakland, we get it because there was a certain point when Oscar Grant was killed, and even though he was killed by a different agency, people were so pissed because it'd been like seven shootings, like in like a certain amount of weeks or it was just something like that. It was just crazy. And well, people had enough. In Miami too, not so long ago, I want to say 2010 or 11 in the city of Miami where yeah. we're based, there were seven shootings in six or seven months, all unarmed black men. Yeah. 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 So, so anyways, yeah. So I got, I got into the neighborhood where Mike Brown was killed, which is just right off the main road where all the stuff was going down. And I, I met a, a young man by the name of David Witt, and he had like, he, I think he had, a, he had a shirt that said, stand on your rights. I was like, I gotta, I gotta talk to him. <laughs> and so, um, so we linked up and we talked and, and yeah, and it, it just, it sounded like there's a very, very racist police force. The KKK is really big out there. And when you've got a, a police force like that, that's just jacking you every day, you know, everybody has warrants for stuff they didn't do. 
You know, people just had enough. Well, forget warrants for stuff they didn't do. Uh, just warrants for non-payment. It yeah. sounds like everything there was set up to collect taxes. You know, they made police into revenue officers up there, and they still do. Yeah, yeah. And in every town in America. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's, you know, and that's very consistent with what police do is, is that they extort people for money and, and, and you know, they, they solidify their own job by, by justifying it through crime and all this stuff. But there's a lot of people getting paid as a result of this. So. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the, without the money, the system would grind to a halt. I mean, the police are not out there raiding apartments to try and stop people that are burgling uh, neighborhoods. They're, they're looking for the big drug raid because that's what the cash is. Yeah, drug asset forfeitures, like all that. It's like, it's really, 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 really real. And in Ferguson, you could see how real it was. And so at that time period, the community had kicked the cops out of Canfield, the neighborhood where Mike Brown was murdered. And, and so there was a lot of stuff happening on the main road, but no police were coming in. And so I was staying there. I, I needed a place like we had been gassed for an hour. And I was in touch with Dave, and he had already offered his space. And you know, they were they wanted to defy the curfew. And I was like, oh yeah, I'll totally stand with you guys. Like, you know, I do stuff around police accountability. And Dave was like, great. And um, you know, but we hadn't gotten to cop watch yet. But anyway, so there was this one night we got gas for an hour. I'm like, dude, I got to get in. And so, um, so I you got tear gassed, by the way, for our audience. You're not yeah. just tired from running a marathon. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was like just a long, long night. And there's live rounds getting shot. And like that's something that's not reported enough about the police um, is that they were shooting live rounds. And people were shot in the crowd and stuff did happen. So it was very, very animated. It was very live. And um, yeah, so I ended up staying with Dave Witt. <laughs> and out of, you know, that, that stay there, we came to the conclusion that, you know, the cops are going to come back. And what's, you know, what's the next step? And, and, you know, people really just wanted to keep them out. So, so yeah, we came up with a camera idea. It was like very natural, and we decided explain, maybe we should... explain the camera idea to your to our audience because I think it's it's a really great idea. Something yeah, that's done in other communities. Yeah, and it, it is getting done in other communities, so it's it's actually been working out pretty well. But yeah, so the camera initiative basically the idea was here you have a neighborhood that has taken a stand against the police. They don't want the police to come back. They want to they wanna start dealing with the issues in their neighborhood without the police. And what are they going to do? Okay. And it seemed like the first step might be like maybe if we got cameras when they come in that they're not even – they're not going to get out of their car and try to – because the thing is, is once a cop – once a police force loses power, they have to reestablish power. And sure. so anytime that there's a rebellion, anytime that there's a riot, anytime that there's – a situation where the police don't feel in 100% control, at the point that they come back in, they have to reestablish control. And okay. so, yeah, we thought the cameras would be a great way of maybe keeping them in their cars and just keeping them going. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, we the first 24 hours, I put a GoFundMe up for cop watch cameras in Ferguson, and we got like a thousand bucks. And we went to Best Buy. We had, it was hard to get out of the area because there was so many roadblocks and checkpoints and stuff. But we got to Best Buy. We bought I think it was four cameras, handheld cameras, and we got those back, but the money just kept coming in. And so we were like, wow, you know, bigger than this neighborhood watch, this community, this group of people that, that, that are willing to actually do this, maybe we should train everybody in Campfield about their rights and get everybody a camera. And so that, that became the next project. And we ended up like fundraising almost $8,000 to this point on the GoFundMe, but then we got an extra $10,000. So Wow. We up, yeah, we bought. That's a good amount of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We bought 200 um, body cameras and we bought them because they were cheap. They were things like at that point, the cops were really, really on edge. Felt like well, maybe having something that you clip, you're not going to, you don't have to, you know, just pull something out and point it and get shot. You know what I mean? Just trying to like take a stand. So we got the clip ons um, and we started doing trainings. We, we train people with the phones too, like get yourself a streaming app. If you're pulled over, you know, use this and this, you know, but this right here goes from beginning to end, you know what right. I mean? Continuous, unedited, and, you know, and that could be a value if you're actually dealing with the police where they're coming at you and, you know, trying to harass you. So, so in September, I came back out. We, we trained the neighborhood. We, we handed out cameras, and it just kind of like kept going from there. And, 
honestly, I, I don't even know of a police arrest that's happened in that neighborhood since. Like, the cops don't get out of their cars. Like, and if they do, it's because, you know, maybe somebody called them, you know. But, but you know, since the Mike Brown thing, it's, you know, it's been a very big movement to not call the police. So that uh, that's very interesting because there's a big topic in the, the press about de-policing and how police are really trying to scare the public by saying, well, we're just going to kind of walk off the job and let anything happen. Yeah. New York city, that worked out well. Problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Um, well, first of all, we saw that in New York city and New York city survived very well. Uh, when the cops stood down after those two cops got shot. And I don't know if you've heard about that, but like there was a blue flu where the police oh, yeah, were. Yeah. yeah. So, so New York did well. And, um, but the other thing is, is, I mean, if the cops stand down and they're not chasing people, they're not extorting people for money, they're not breaking up families, then there's there. I mean, because the way I look at it, and I tell every cop this, it's like not about hating you or saying fuck the police, although, you know, sometimes we say fuck the police, but it's more about you guys are actual willing participants in creating the problems in the society that you say you're here to stop and keep people safe from, right? Like, Cops keep poor people poor. They help keep poor people poor. Because in any poor neighborhood, whether it's white, black, whatever, you're going to see the way cops treat people differently, the way they, they jack people, the way they arrest people, the way they physically, you know, put their hands on people. It's very different. And you know, were you going to say something? Yeah, no, I was just, you know, you're making me think of a, a friend I used to have in, in a local police force here. He's a motorcycle cop. And... Uh, one day I just, you know, I was driving down the street and I just said hi. And we were chatting for a while and we finished. And he said, okay, man, really sorry, but I got to go to back to ruining a few people's afternoons. Yeah. Great Argon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a very wealthy neighborhood. This is not in a poor neighborhood. This is a very ritzy neighborhood, actually. <clears throat> but, I mean, he was one of those who really felt bad about the net effect of when he issued a ticket. Yeah. But there's there's a lot of cops that are part of the problem. Yeah. And all cops and, are part, all, all cops, not to cut you off, but I mean, all cops are part of the problem because the, 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 the issues that come up is one job security. So rookies, rookies go hard and they go hard, you know, so, so these new cops that go hard the first 10 years on promotions, right? So they're running after people, they're jacking people, they're doing everything that they joined up for. You know, if they want to hurt people, they're hurting people. If they're, they're chasing people, that's what it is. If it's feeling powerful and in control of things, like whatever it is, they're doing it. But there's incentive to stop as many people as possible. There's incentive to get, you know, you know the stats, all that stuff. And by the, I mean, this is true in Oakland too. I mean, we got cops that have shot three, four people. Once they're in 10, 15 years and they get a couple kids, they start transitioning into a different, I don't give a fuck mentality because they see that they haven't made a difference. They see that, that they actually like help contribute to making the world a, a worse place, not a better place. And it, it, it's really like, it, it's gotta be a very, very depressing job. And so, you know, I look at it like it doesn't matter whether you're a great person or you're a wonderful mother or it doesn't matter what it is. Like I'm not, when I say I'm anti-cop, I'm not saying that I, I'm full of hatred. Like, I don't got time to hate. You know what I mean? Like, that's poisonous. I don't want to be like them. I'm saying I'm anti-cop because the job doesn't work. Because it, Or maybe it does very much too well, you know, for what it does do. But whatever they're saying it's supposed to be for, it's not the case. Like, they're not here to, like, keep society safe or to protect people. Because if that was the case, we'd be able to put a lot more money and resources and attention into into things that that need to be taken care of you know like people need food and well it's it's an odd situation because the the supreme court decided uh back in the mid 2000s <clears throat> that police are not there to protect any one individual um we hire police to enforce the law and that whole moniker of protect and serve that's really just more cop pr yep um which, which it brings to mind the incident that happened in Garland, Texas, uh, with Pamela Geller and these folks in their offensive drawing contest. Um, and, and a lot of people said, well, you know, the shameful thing that they did was involving the police in that. But the police didn't have to involve themselves in that. Mm -hmm. They, they kind of chose to get in there, uh, which is odd. 
because they they usually don't choose to protect any one individual. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean, let let's talk about Baltimore because you know we kind of talked about Ferguson, we talked about New York and what happened in December. Uh, then things kind of quieted down after December a little bit. I mean, there's still a flurry of incidents going on. Um, but uh, up until the Freddie Gray arrest, um, things were a little bit more calm, simmering, let's say. Um, so let's pick it up from, from the Freddie Gray incident. What was your re initial reaction um, when you saw some of the video of Freddie Gray being dragged into a police van and then hearing the news that he had uh, basically put on life support did when when's the first time it crossed your radar uh okay so as i remember it it, it was like right around like with walter scott in north charleston yeah, and yeah. um <clears throat> oh, okay so so yeah like and and i think we got to go to ferguson to get to north charleston to get to baltimore because <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful story but um so so much training we've done so much training in in ferguson that like you know the the year started with a lot of people documenting their police stops like the consciousness is so big in st louis like i don't know if you guys saw the bus where everybody even the bus driver had their hands up everyone's black the white cops get on with their you know looking for a robbery suspect it's just like come on this is ridiculous and then we get another person coming forward with the cops are trying to plant a gun in his car and, and so it's just like wow okay like for us we were really excited because the new year was starting with like this cop watch consciousness in, yeah. in the st louis county we're like man we got to make this grow we're going to bring this across the country before you know because we can actually stop stuff from happening and uh bam like north charleston happens this you know man is shot in the back by a cop the cop plants the taser and mind you this is not very uncommon this is not uncommon this is not something that doesn't happen. It happens every day, all the time. I mean, we've got what I don't know how many people get killed by the cops every day, but it's pretty substantial. And well, I, I think the, the the most chilling thing about Michael Slager's uh, just heinous act wasn't just that he shot a man in the back who was running, and it wasn't just that he planted the evidence, but it was that he coolly like played the part into his police microphone. So that it, 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 you know, on the tape, it sounded like, uh, you know, we're struggling, I'm shooting, hey, you're under arrest, you know, I mean, he ran up to a man he had just shot eight times in the back and he yelled, right, yeah. you're under arrest for the, the dispatch to hear. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's really important to know that all, probably all cops go through that same training, that the use of force... A use of force report, when you write it, you have to inflate the threat. So you have to say that you warn the person multiple times. You have to say that they reach for their waistband. And you have to say that you fear for your safety. So I don't care what town, what city, where you are. When the police kill somebody and you read the newspaper report, you're going to hear these things. That the person lunged at them. That the person reached for their waistband. That the officer was in fear for his safety. And that the officer told the person multiple times. This is time and time again. And the reason why it's time and time again is because they go through training on how to write use of force reports so that they will be able to get away with murder. And it gets to the point where all cops know I can get away with murder if I play this out the right way. Bring you to North Charleston. You know? Sure. So. So, so not long after North Charleston, the Freddie Gray incident happens. And uh, what was your response when, you, when it came across your radar? Okay, so we sent some people from Ferguson to North Charleston, and we helped support, yeah, so we had boots on the ground out there just, you know, supporting people that wanted to start a cop watch, an autonomous cop watch, you know, and, um, and that's what it's all about is, is creating decentralized cop watch groups, doesn't matter what their name is, what they do, the whole idea is, is that when you're cop watching, you're out there looking out for the person that's being stopped, and, sure. and so how you carry yourself and what you do with that video, you know, is very, you, you know, you, you see it. Like, like cop watchers don't necessarily put video online because somebody might need that video for their case, you know. Um, so we were out there, and it was, it was folks in Ferguson, you know, teaching other people about their rights. And, and then around that same time, Baltimore happens. And so 
you know, again, like we just got some great cop watches in Ferguson and they're like, man, we, we want to go out. And so we dispatched some people out to Baltimore and not, you know, they didn't even have cameras, like just getting out there. And, um, and so, yeah, the, they were out there for a little bit the first time around, like, like for a few days. And then once stuff started kicking off, we, we sent them out again. And, um, and one of them, Chad, oh, my God, Chad Jackson, he is incredible. So he met Kevin Moore, who's the guy that filmed Freddie Gray. Okay. And, um, and they, like, just, it was just like this. And so Kevin's like, oh, man, I've been doing this. I'd love to start a cop watch. You're like, great. Okay, cool. So I'm, I'm out here. I'm, I'm, I've I got a day job, and I really got to keep it. And so, you know, we helped get, you know, cop watches out to uh, – you know, out there the second time. Oh wait, sorry, I'm getting all confused. Um, the <laughs> second time, Chad's out there. And we've got Talal. So they're they're with Kevin, and and what ends up happening is that the police target all of them and and arrest them one night, and um, and they like they they release Kevin fairly quickly, but they end up charging Talal and Chad with like crazy stuff. They said at first like terrorism, and then it was inciting a riot and. You know, it was just, it was clearly like, you know, politically motivated. Right. And, and so at that point, you know, we had to go. So, so uh, Dave Wick from, from Ferguson, he went and I went and, um, and, you know, we just, we went out there and we, we were there to like support. And um, well, now let's make it clear. You had to go to Baltimore, not leave because you were being harassed by the police. Oh, no, no, no. They got harassed by the police. They got arrested, and we had to go out and support because you okay. can't. I'm not going to let a cop watch you go down. So, so yeah, we flew out. We made a big stink. Thank you, Carlos, for for covering it because you know you can always count on Carlos to make something go viral. And, Carlos Miller. Yeah, Carlos Miller. So Carlos put a uh, put a put a piece out, just just you know, recording what happened, documenting what happened, and you know, and then you've got you know, newspapers all over the country covering it. So, so you know, it was really, really helpful. And our, our stay there was very beautiful because in this case, it wasn't a community that was, like, interested in starting a cop watch. It was a community that's been cop watching, you know, and, and, and doing it because they have to, because their lives depend on it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's so inspirational. It should be inspirational to us all. It, it is. I mean, I spoke to Kevin. He was like, man, I was – I was just hanging out on the couch when I heard about this. Yeah. And he had the presence of mind to go out and get what I would call the seminal uh, cop watching video of 2015. If not, maybe one of the all time most important film events besides uh, Fiedland Santana's uh, filming of Michael Slager. I mean, we can, we can recite them. There's been quite a few citizen yeah. journalists who have captured Amazing footage, or been the subject of footage. Yeah. Um, as we Ramsey, saw and Ramsey Orta, Orta, Ramsey Orta, you know, and it's right, like Ramsey. And, yeah. So in this situation, we weren't going to let another Ramsey Orta happen. We weren't going to have Kevin Moore get hit. We weren't going to let our cop watches go down. So well, explain that to our audience because not everybody has read that piece on Ramsey. Ramsey filmed Eric Garner. Yeah, Ramsey Orta, just like all these cop watchers, you know, took big risks by documenting what they were doing. And even more, put big risks putting it out, knowing what they were up against, knowing what retaliation they could face, and and did it anyways. And so I, I think just God, when you when you hear about somebody documenting something that's so tragic, we got to support these people. And even if it's like sending them some money, anything, like you know, we got to like commend people that take a stand and, and go out and document the police. And especially in these situations where like the police are actually doing stuff that results in like murder and, you know, so, so yeah, Ramsey, Ramsey got it bad. They, they targeted him, they hit him and, you know, gave him, you know, suggestible, you know, charges and, and he's facing and he's catching hell for it, you know, catching hell for taking a stand for the people, you know, so, so, so you guys have set up some chapters. Where are the, the We Cop Watch chapters today? Okay, so one thing that's important to note is that these chapters, it's more like, okay, so we've got a We Cop Watch in Oakland, we've got a We Cop Watch in Baltimore, we've got a We Cop Watch in Ferguson, we've got a We Cop Watch in Detroit. But okay. each one of these We Cop Watches, there's actually an autonomous on-the-ground group that's not called We Cop Watch. 
Because like what we cop watch is, is it's like the cream of the crop. It's the people that are like, man, I want to help support getting other cop watches started. Because you like, guys are the umbrella group. We cop watch is the umbrella group. So, <laughs> so they're like cop watch groups, like Baltimore cop watch. Is that, I mean, I just curious what they're calling themselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so I don't know. I don't know if uh, the Baltimore crew has a name yet, but, um, but the, uh, but and and the folks in in Oakland, it's like a collective. It's like 20, 30 people and different mm -hmm. social groups and you know. And communities but they're all together they're all like sure. you know taking a stand so it's hard to like call call it a name but with uh ferguson it's called the canfield watchman um okay. but the we cop watch thing is about people that are going to not only take a stand in their community but are, are trying to help other people know about their rights and know about cop watching and and, and specifically willing to help people get their own cop watches started so Jacob, where can people in our audience contact you if they want to start a cop watch in their community? I would say just go to wecopwatch at Gmail and subject line it trying to start a cop watch group. Okay, so send an email to wecopwatch at gmail.com. Yep. You can also, um, you know, we're going to invite our readers and, and our viewers on YouTube to comment on this video. And Jacob, we're, we're, I'm going to just have to trust you to go through the comments, but I'm sure you'll check them out, right? Yep. So uh, you can send an email to Jason at wecopwatch at gmail.com, or you could comment on this video if you're interested in starting a cop watch group in your neighborhood to keep your citizens, your neighbors, safe from the police when police ride off the rails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, and, and, and it's just really important to know that it, it, you don't have to be a cop watch group. You don't have to have a shirt. You know, you don't have to be a self-proclaimed journalist. Like, you have the right to watch the police. And so my, my suggestion is, is if you see the police doing something and you have an opportunity to have people come with you, I would say, man, get, get another friend and just stop and watch. And when the cops say, can I help you, go, nah, actually, unless you want to give me the incident report number and your badge number, and why you stop this person, I'm cool. I'm just here to watch. I'm, I'm not here to interfere. And I, I just try to let the, the person being stopped know that, hey, there's somebody here for you. And, um, and, and, and it's possible. I mean, I, oh God, I, I was cop watching at 5.30 this morning when they were uh, throwing flashbang grenades outside of my window, you know, and raiding multiple houses on my block. And wow. I was able to do that with, you know, with people. And then, Oh God! I, you know, it's like I just went out to lunch and I get stuck on a half an hour. But my, I know my 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 presence made a difference because I I watched somebody in handcuffs and they wanted to arrest this person so bad they had him on some sort of arrestable you know offense that had no victim associated to it. But uh, but you know I just stood there. I didn't even record. I just put the camera up and 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 I stayed far enough away. And and I know my impact made a difference. And so you got to know that like. Man, fighting the police is hard, but you know, making your presence known and, and making a difference in the moment isn't. And it, it really just comes down to you and you having the courage. And my other thing I'd say is, is that if you're going to watch the police, you know, man, it's great to get some bad stuff and put it online and show the world how messed up the police are. But man, there's something even more powerful about making your presence known and being a deterrent to police misconduct. And so we. When we walk up to a stop, when I walk up to a stop, I treat it like a hostage negotiation situation. I'm like, things are going down, there's hostages, and my job is to get those hostages free from that crazy person with the gun. And so I'm not gonna walk up to them and yell at them. I'm not gonna like agitate the situation. I'm gonna be like, all right, you know? And at first just make my presence known and you know, we do what we have to do, but the idea is, is not to interfere, the idea is, is to well, that's, like a, that's a really important point. Um, Non-interference. We're, we're there to, to be a witness. Yeah, yeah. And to be a deterrent, you know, because there is such thing as advocating for somebody without, without interfering. For instance, I'll walk, up to, uh, I'll walk up to a car where somebody's been stopped, and while the police officer is in their car doing whatever, I'll give that person a cop watch card that has their rights on it, you know? I'm not interfering by doing that. I'm, I'm advocating for the person. And, uh, and at the end of the day, I'm making the situation better because somebody now has their, you know, their rights. And 
you know, and that can only have favorable conclusions. I mean, it's better to know your rights than not, right? So that it is. Well, yeah. Jacob, I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy day today yeah. to join us on PINAC Live. It's it's been very illuminating, and I think any citizen journalist could learn something from from watching our interview today. Cool. Well, my last thing would say, if, if you guys believe in what We Cop Watch does and what Cop Watch does and people that go out and take a stand, you know, consider throwing some money down to any of these camera drives. I mean, we've got a, an Oakland We Cop Watch camera drive on GoFundMe. We've got uh, one for Detroit. We've got one for North Charleston. We've got one for Baltimore. And we got one for Ferguson. So, you know, drop a dime. It doesn't matter what it is. Like, we're buying cameras for people. And we're equipping them. And, and at the end of the day... There's so many things that you could do to make the world a better place. When you go out on the streets and you watch the police and you help keep somebody free, you're slowing down that system that's just designed to keep people down. You know, and that, that's, that's wonderful. So one last time, if you want to learn more, you go to? You go to WeCopWatch.org. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. All right. Well, Jacob, that's all we got for this hour. But we'll be back with more PINAC Live soon. I'm Grant Stern. This is PINAC News. Be the media.